Welcome back, everybody. We're going to now go and explore what happens now that that baby is born, that we learn everything from preconception to birth in Chapter 2. Uh, kind of surprising how much prenatally it will affect a child down the road, which we're going to be learning about in the um, coming up chapters. But this next chapter, we're going to learn tools for exploring the world, physical, perceptual, and motor development. So this is going to um, cover birth to two years old. So you can imagine if you've been around children, you know, your own children, think about everything that that child learns from the time they're born, where they're completely dependent on you till the time they're two. Think of everything that has to, um, they have to learn from talking to walking to uh, a havoc wreaking toddler, right? So we're going to learn about all those development, physical, uh, psychological, social, cultural. We're going to think about the development of Erickson and Piaget as we are going through this as well. So the next uh, lecture, as we go through this, we're going to be developing that. So we're going to go continue on to the next slide here. So we're going to begin chapter three, which will cover birth to age two. And it is a period of growth like none other. No changes in the rest of life compares to the excitement and spectacle of the first two years of life. So just picture that newborn helpless baby that depends on you for everything. And then now pic picture your two-year-old rambunctious independent toddler. How does one go from being that helpless newborn to that mischievous two-year-old? We will look at the changes that take place in the brain during this period of growth. And we'll also look at how does a child learn how to walk and communicate with its environment. So if you want to look at physical development in infancy and, a to and toddlerhood in a nutshell, we could just look at these pictures of these two children. It shows highlights of their first two years. When you look at this, what do you see? Are they the same at the beginning to the end? Lots of different changes, right? laying on their back helpless to then we see the about seven eight months standing crawling 11 months walking and by 22 months you see interaction with the environment physically and uh, cognitively so as we discover and go through this chapter we're going to learn all about that and discover how that infant went from helplessness to independence so when we left off in chapter two, our baby was just born. And we know from that chapter that they had many things that happened prenatally with their development. So what they're gonna, the doctors are gonna do within the first few minutes, um, first minute actually of that baby being born is assess, assess its development. They're gonna do an APGAR, APGAR scoring system. So the newborn in their picture right here is actually your um, textbook author's son. Um, his name is Ben Kale, and he's 20 seconds old. So what can we tell from just looking at this baby at 20 seconds old? So the first thing we can see that it's covered in vernix, and that's that white um, uh, material on the skin to protect it. The second thing we can notice is that it's the legs are bow-legged, and that um, is from the positioning in the womb. And the third thing we can notice is that the head is distorted from the journey down the birth canal. So within 20 seconds, just observation, we can we can see physically the development of that baby. We can see it has hands and toes. We can see that is it doesn't have any it doesn't have an organ on the outside. So we can just physically observe and see how that baby is um, developed. So what do they do to determine if this baby is born healthy? Like I said, the birth medical team assesses the infant using an APGAR score. And this is something that they will follow them as they're going through their pediatrician as they get older, especially if they're premature. They want to know what their APGAR score was, because that's going to give them information if they had difficulty at birth and maybe how that affects their development long term. So as you can see, the APGAR score, and this is a picture right there on your screen, and it scores five vital signs that receive a score from zero to two with zero being absent, not present, and two being ideal. It assesses breathing, heart rate, muscle tone, presence of reflexes, and skin tone. And this score is done at one minute, five minute, after birth. 
Now, if there was a need for resuscitation, so they went into cardiac arrest, they weren't breathing or they, um, their heart wasn't beating, then the APGAR scores are repeated at 10 minutes and 20 minutes, and in some cases, 30 minutes. And then that baby is in, in the NICU and receiving um, medical attention. So let's take a look at what the APGAR scoring system involves. So on the left, you're going to see that that APGAR, that each letter stands for something. So A is activity, which is muscle tone. So that's just how much um, ability does that baby have to move mus its muscles. So zero would be none, so they're not moving at all. Uh, one point would be flexed arms and legs, so they're not, they're keeping their arms flexed even when you change their position. They're not straightening, which would be a natural response, reflex, to um, when you're moving to support yourself. Um, and two points is active, so you're just going to see their arms kind of flailing and moving around. No purposeful movement, but they're, they, they have muscle tone they can move. Uh, the second one is pulse, so absent as an emergency, they will begin to uh, have a cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Below 100 is one point, and over 100 is two points. So remember, babies have higher heart rate. G is for grimace. So that's the reflex irritability. So if they do some kind of stimulus, maybe rub their thumb along the foot uh, of the baby. If the baby is floppy, just kind of stays in... Um, doesn't have really any movement it just is um, we consider like a low tone it just the muscles the body just stays there that would be a zero one point would be a minimal response just maybe if they if i rub my my uh nail along the the insole of a foot it just responds a little bit and a two would be a full-on you know response that really moves his leg away so um that would be the grimace an A is appearance, so blue. So we know when a person is blue or pale, that means they're not getting good circulation, good blood flow. That's, again, in a medical emergency uh, for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The one is pink body but blue extremities, so that means there's not getting enough blood flow out to the arms and legs. And two is pink all over, so that means good blood flow, everything is circulating correctly. R is respiration, so zero is absent, so if they're not breathing, again, that's an emergency situation. One is slow and irregular, so they're maybe not um, taking, the respiratory rate is really low, so they're not taking enough breaths for a minute. They're having long gas between. And two is vigorously crying, so that is why you want your baby to cry, and hearing that sound of cry is the best sound you ever hear to give birth. That means that the lungs are working well, and that they're able to breathe on their own. So the higher the APCAR score, the healthier the baby is. And any score lower than a seven is a sign that the baby needs some type of medical attention. The lower the score, the more help the baby needs to adjust to the outside of the mother's womb. And most of the time, a low, a low APCAR score is caused by a difficult birth. So. Some things to um, picture when you're thinking right out of the gate when that baby is born, how healthy is it? So that's going to determine how they develop because the healthier the baby is at the starting point, the better building blocks they have to develop normally. And if not, what, what things will we see in abnormal development? So we're going to go on to the next slide, which we're going to talk about new, newborn reflexes and what we should be seeing as this newborn begins to develop. So now we're going to move on to how does a newborn learn how to do the things that it needs to do? Well, part of that is reflexes. How does a baby know when to eat? How to, you know, respond to its mother? So part of all that is reflexes, and that will eventually be integrated into purposeful movement. So what are reflexes, and why are they so important? So reflexes are an unlearned response to stimuli. So it's just what your body does when it's stimulated, whether by touch, sound, other things. So it is not purposeful. It's just a auto automatic response. The baby has no control. And reflexes help newborns interact with the world. So by allowing those reflexes, it allows them to learn skills. Eventually, 
will be integrated if needed, and some will stay permanently as a lifelong um, skill needed. So reflexes allow the baby to, in, to interact with the environment, to learn the needed skills, and they start to go away as those skills are learned, and some stay for um, lifelong pro protection. So let's take a look at these newborn reflexes. I'm going to have a supplemental video showing some of the common ones in this list so that you can visually see it. So by seeing it, you're going to understand it a little more, and then you're just going to be able to put that picture with these words to mind. So these are really important for healthcare practitioners, physical therapists, occupational therapists. I treated pediatrics for about a year, and you want to know and understand the reflexes because you need to know when you should be seeing them, when they should be gone, because they're going to give you a lot of information on why that child isn't developing the way they need to be, or are they hitting their milestones, are they, are they um, able to do what they need to do for that age appropriate task? And if not, maybe it's because a reflex is still there that shouldn't be. So let's take a look at these reflexes. So the first one is Babinski. And if you've ever seen a lot of this was a pretty common one. Um, people, a lot of people probably maybe have seen this. When you take your thumb and you, with your thumb now you stroke the instep of the baby's uh, foot and the toes will fan out with the sole of the foot is stroked from head to toe. So you will see that um, right when they're born and it goes away around 8 to 12. Why do you think it goes around around 8 to 12? What, what happens in that stage? That's when children start to put weight on their feet, right, and walking. So every time they had some kind of stimulant on their foot and their toes fanned out, they would never be able to walk. So it's really important that that starts to go away. But it's important that they have that reflex so they can begin to understand that foot can begin its movement and understand how it needs to move. So it's a significance, it's permanent, it's a perhaps a remnant of evolution. So it just allows that foot to begin precursor movement to being able to accept weight. The second one is a blink. So do you think that's a permanent or is gonna gonna um, go away yes a permanent so a baby's eyes close in response to bright light or loud noise as do ours right um, and that protects the eyes so we don't have unpleasant stimuli that could injure our eyes or keep our eyes um, dry so it's definitely a long-term reflex that never goes away the third one is a moro so this is when you take a baby and you either startle it or you tilt its head downward. And what you're going to see is that the baby's arms go out to the side, like backwards, and then come right back into a full hug. Uh, and why that's important is that it helps the baby cling to its mother. So early on, think about a hundred, a thousand years ago, when, um, Women were much more mobile. They had to work right after their babies, right? Or when we're trying to take care of their children, they need that baby to lap, to securely stay on them. That baby needs to know that to in order to survive, they need to be able to cling to their mother. To get food, they need to be able to cling to their mother because their mother is their food source. So all that's instinctive uh, so that they don't, um, so they stay safe. So it's all about in those first, you know, months is, being able to stay alive. So one of the things to stay alive is to be able to cling to your mom and to be able to be transported from where you need to go to get the food that you need to go and to stay in her safe protection so that you don't fall off and die. So basically it's a survival uh, reflex. And at about six months, you're gonna learn what happens. Well, that baby can start to sit up by itself. So it doesn't need to have that, to be clinging to something all the time. If it's clinging to its mother all the time, it's never going to be able to gain the muscle control the, in their abdomen and trunk to be able to sit up on themselves. So it has to go away and become voluntary. So now the baby can learn, if I don't fall off because I now have the muscle control, I can cling on to it myself. But reflexively, I don't want to just cling and not have a choice because I need to do other things. I need to be moving on to the next stage of development, which is sitting and crawling and if every time my head tilts backward, I'm going to extend and grasp onto something, I'm never going to be able to meet, reach the next milestone. The next one we're gonna look at is Palmer. 
And that is just a precursor to voluntary grasping. Um, so what you do is just, again, this is all auto, auto, automatic. The baby has no volitional control. So if you've ever put a toy in a baby's hand and they just wrap around or your finger, you know, when you put your, your finger into the palm of a baby and they just grab onto it. Well, it's not because they love you so much or they just love holding onto your hand. It's because it's a reflex and that it, they have no control over it. But what it's telling it is telling that mu that hand, giving it muscle memory on how to open and close because you can break their reflex as you take their finger out. So it's a precursor to that voluntary grasping. Now, we don't want it to stay forever because, well, how are you ever going to, to hold something and then release it? You don't want every time your hand touches something to grasp onto it. You want to be able to have dexterity and control. So it usually goes around about three to four months, and that's when the baby's starting to maybe can start holding, holding things, uh, maybe start feeding itself a little, you know, a little bit with that hand starting to practice those skills so if that grasp just grasping every time they touch something they'll never be able to practice and have volitional control the next one is rooting so this is very again it's a very primitive very important for survival reflex and it doesn't last very long um, so if you've ever done this you know if you fed a baby or if you've seen this and you want him to um, find the bottle or find them the mother's nipple you just kind of stroke the cheek and the child will turn its head towards the stroking and open its mouth. So again, survival, right, for feeding. So it helps the baby find the nipple, helps it prepare knowing that it's going to have something open its mouth, um, preparing it for food. And it needs to go away at about three to four weeks because then it's we have that start of the next skill level is turning the head. So if every time that she was stroked and the baby would just, you know, go towards that, they would never be able to volitionally control their head movement to be able to respond to the environment around them and eventually be able to roll and hold their head up and all that. So it needs to be done the first three to four weeks because they need to be fed. They need to survive and they need to gain weight. But once they have started that and the other um, skills starting to develop, they can um, that rooting reflex needs to go away so they can ha start having purposeful control of their head. The next reflex is a stepping reflex. And you can imagine what that's for. Um, so if you've ever done this, if you held a baby upright and then you you um, move it forward, you miraculously have started your baby walking. Do you think that that baby's really taking steps on their own? No, it's a reflex and it's a precursor to walking. So um, it's just preparing them. So a lot of walking, even we found this as um, treating spinal cord injuries and stuff, is reflexive. If you put them on the treadmill and we put them in a, a harness support and you move the treadmill, the feet move. It's part of this primitive reflex that we can pull into um, and it, go, it goes away at two to three months, but it's kind of always dormant in there. If you, um, so part of walking is always some part of reflex. You kind of just go with it, but for the most part, it, it goes away. So it goes away so that you can control your walking. Um, but it's that first step of that baby learning how to coordinate all those steps. So your baby is not walking by itself. It is reflexively taking steps. And again, it goes away at about two to three months so that the um, every time the baby stands, it's not going to start trying to move its feet. It needs to have stability before it gets mobility. But it needs to learn that um, when you have that stimuli between two to three months, it helps move all the, our, the legs together. To get that preparation so remember it does go away at two to three months and it's a precursor to walking uh, another uh, reflex sucking very much like rooting important for feeding so um right this one permits feeding it's a baby sex when an object is placed in its mouth whatever it is so you put a pacifier a bottle put your finger sometimes to see them it's reflexive up until about four months and then it's replaced by voluntary sucking and then they control when they want to suck because the first four months, can you think, the most important survival is getting fed, right? Being able to put on weight so that you can develop. If you don't have enough nutrition, your cells, your brain, your body cannot grow and develop. So it's a very, very um, important reflex that for survival. And then the last one is withdrawal. A baby withdraws its foot when the sole is pricked with a pen. Uh, and it's permanent, so it protects the baby from unpleasant stimulation. So 
we all need a um, pain withdrawal um, reflex, else we would just continue to hurt ourselves, right? If we didn't withdraw from pain and we stood on um, like a nail or something, we would have permanent damage. So it's, it's a permanent one to protect us. Pain is to protect us technically from injuring ourselves. It's one of our um, senses that protects our body. So those are the reflexes. Definitely know them, understand them. And again, watch the video to see them so you can put the whole picture together and understand which ones are permanent and which ones go away and why. Like, why is that important? And you're going to understand it a little better as we look at the developmental milestones in this age group. Video. So you're going to watch this in your supplemental and he's about to perform the um, the uh, moral reflex there. But um, go ahead and watch these because this is the way you're going to understand them and give you better preparation for the test. So now we're gonna look at some of the ways that we can actually assess the newborn baby, that we can see if they are developing appropriately, incorporate some of those reflexes that we learned about in the other slide. So one test set or one scale that you can use is the Neonatal Behavioral Assessment Scale, the NBAS. And this can be used with newborns to 24 month old infants and Anybody older, it's not appropriate. Uh, it gives a detailed picture of the baby's behavior, and it evaluates functioning of four systems. The assessment includes 28 behavior items and 18 reflex tests. So as we look through this, we're going to kind of go over what these uh, four systems are. Autonomic is your ability to control body functions like breathing and temperature regulation. So even for us in the human in adults that you know our autonomic is our breathing our respiratory rate our heart control which we consider our autonomic system um, some developmental delays some diagnosis some pathologies have difficulties with that and if you're not physiologically healthy that can affect your overall development so it's an important uh, behavior to assess in the scale to give us more information on where that baby is in development the second thing they want to look at is motor, so the ability to control body movement and activity level. This is where your reflexes are going to come in. Are they appropriate? Are they integrating when they should be? Are they, you know, um, or are they sticking around when they shouldn't? Are they able to move and hit the milestones that are appropriate? So that's the motor. State. So status is basically the ability to maintain in a state staying awake or staying asleep. So babies definitely have wake sleep patterns that are important for development. And we're gonna go over those um, a little bit later in the chapter, but this assesses that. And if your baby is staying awake too much or staying asleep too much, it's definitely going to affect your development. And the last one is social, the ability to interact with people. Does your baby engage when you talk to it? Does it look and follow your voice? Is it, you know, engaged with the environment around? Or does it, you know, not turn when it hears your voice? Is it not have much activity? You can't stimulate it much, very kind of lethargic. So they're going to see socially how well it interacts with this environment, because that's extremely important, right? Because that's how the baby learns all the new skills, is that interaction with the environment. So we're going to now, as you assess this baby, so you do assessment like that, then you can determine what developmental stage they're at or what needs the child has and refer them out to help them. Or you can see the right on scale uh, with normal development. And it's all ranges. There's no perfect scale, but it's all ranges. And you have to remember too why it's so important to know their prenatal development. If they had a low APGAR test, if they were premature, these are going to affect the neonatal behavior assessment scale. And it's gonna give you more information to why maybe they didn't do as well. So this is again, it's a stepping off point to determine how that baby is developing and are they hitting all the correct milestones? And if not, can we get them services and understand why they're not? So this allows us to diagnose and get treatment early on to help um, prevent these abnormal findings from progressing and becoming worse as they age. So now let's take a look at the newborn states. So in the NBAS, one of the categories was states, and we talked about 
awakeness and sleep being asleep. So states of awake and the states of sleep. So what exactly does that mean? So newborns alternate among four states. So it's, it's more complicated than just being awake and being asleep. So you're going to want to understand what are the four states of a newborn. So newborns sleep a lot, right? But not all sleep is the same. So let's take a look and see what's, what the four states are. So alert, inactivity is calm, eyes, open, inspecting the environment, looks deliberately. So that's your alert, really alert child, looking around, calm, not crying, but just looking around their environment, very alert, responding to your voice, responding to, you know, your play. They're that and that alert. They're the most alert awake they can be, but they're not crying and their eyes have to be open. The second state is waking activity. So that is the, this state, the eyes are open. They're moving their arms and legs uncoordinated, but they're unfocused. So their waking activity, maybe they're not as alert and they're maybe not following your stimuli, but they're moving their arms and legs, but no particular reason, eyes are open. So that's waking activity. So that's a step below full alertness. Crying. So crying is the third state. Vigorous crying usually accompanied by agitated, uncoordinated movements. So we've all seen this in a baby, right? Crying, you know, mad, throwing their head back, movements. Down back. I mean, they're just using their body to express uh, their frustration, their agitation. So crying accompanied by agitated, uncoordinated movements. And then the fourth state is sleeping and alternates between stillness with regular breathing to moving gently and breathing irregularly, always with the eyes closed. So like I said, there's various states of sleeping, uh, but the eyes would, are always closed and they um, go from stillness to movement. So they actually, you know, have breathing, uh, I mean, sorry, they actually have sleeping patterns like we do. They get into deep sleep and other stages. So we'll go over that a little bit later, but those are the four newborn states. So no one, and understand the difference. Alert and alert, inactive, eyes open, very responsive to the environment. Wake activity, eyes are open, but unfocused. That's the difference, they're unfocused. Focused in, alert, inactive, unfocused in wake act activity. Crying, they're crying and flailing, and that's your agitated baby. And then sleeping, it has to be eyes closed and they could be moving or not moving, just depending on what, what um, part of the sleep cycle they're in. So now let's move on to another part of a newborn's day, crying. Crying takes up a huge part as anybody that's been around children or have had their own babies knows. What they found is that newborns cry for two to three hours each day. Exhausting for the caregiver, the parent, and for the baby, but is each cry the same? No. Why do you think they're different? Looking back on what is most important to that baby in the first couple months of life? Why do you think they cry? Because it's the only way they can communicate their needs for survival, for to get fed, to get changed, to find comfort and shelter, because they are completely 100% dependent on another human being. So just like we use words and sounds to communicate, cry is their way of communication. And because of that, they have different cries. They have different needs, just like we use different words for our needs. So let's take a look and go over them. So the first one is a basic cry, soft and gradual, then more intense. So we've all heard this. Your baby's hungry, usually starts off by a little bit of a whimper. You don't feed it right away, it starts to get more intense. So this usually occurs when the baby is tired or hungry. And it can turn into the second cry, which is a mad cry, and it's a more intense version of the basic cry. So that happens when you do not meet the needs um, soon enough. So if you let that baby go 10 minutes without being fed when it wanted to be fed, you know, immediately, it might, it's going to demonstrate a more intense cry because it's not getting its needs met. So that's the only way it has to communicate. So if you're not it's going to give you a little warning. I'm hungry. I'm going to cry, cry. But if you're not getting, you know, the message, it's going to give you a more intense version of that. Same thing if they're soiled or they're dirty. So it's the only way they communicate. So if you're not listening with a little, little soft cry, 
maybe you'll listen with a more mad cry. So that's think of that basic needs. Feeding, dirty diaper, you know, change of position. Your third cry is a pain cry. And that's that sudden long burst of crying followed by a long pause and gasping. So that's almost if you've ever been around a child that has been really, really upset, you're almost afraid they'll stop breathing because they cry <gasps> and then they gasp for air. So you're like, oh my gosh, are they breathing? But that's a pain cry. So with that crying, the question we ask, do you think you should ignore crying or should you, you know, meet their needs? Well, it's kind of a, a loaded question. We didn't ask you when. Timing is everything, right? So basically, the answer would be in the first few months, we need to we need to respond to the crying because that's the only way that a baby can communicate. And the way that that baby, what did we learn in um, through our theorists? What are they learning in the first few months? Basic trust. Well, how do they learn basic trust? We've got to meet their needs. So to be able to get that bond and learn that the world is safe and that their needs are going to be met, we need to answer their cries. We need to show them um, them how to, you know, that we're going to feed them and they're going to be changed and all their needs are going to be met. Now, let's take that baby, you know, nine months later, and now we're going to have to teach them some skills. How do you self-soothe? Are you crying just because you want attention? Because you just would like to rather not be in your bed? You know, uh, you know, the baby starts to communicate their crying in a different way because they've learned. They learn if I cry like this, I'm going to get attention. But that doesn't happen till later. The first few months, they just need to learn, get their basic needs. But once they hit and they start to can use that cry, they need to learn how to self-soothe, um, especially at night, right? So some of the ways to self-soothe is you, you teach the baby, um, you swaddle the baby, you pat the baby, right? You um, mimic the womb, so you rock them. So some of the ways that you can soothe the baby and then you're trying to teach the baby how to self-soothe. You know, you wrap them maybe, you know, when you um, lay them down so that they learn that they're okay. So, yes, there is a time to ignore crying, um, but the first few months are not it. We are building that basic trust, teaching that baby that their basic needs for survival will be met. And that's going to be the foundation of um, development to come. So let's move on to the newborn sleep cycle. So as I stated earlier, newborns have sleep cycles similar to ours. They have cyclic sleep and wakefulness that continues throughout the day. So one of the things you notice about babies is that they, especially newborns, they need a lot of sleep. Uh, that's when they do most of their uh, growing is in their sleep. So for to get that brain to develop, their body to develop, they need to sleep. Um, a cycle of three hours of sleep and one hour of wake, wakefulness continues throughout the day um, up to three to four months. So newborns sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. That's a lot. And remember that cycle of three hours of sleep and then one hour of wakefulness. And that continues three to four months. Have you seen that trend with, with your babies or being around that babies? When they wake, rotates through the states. So remember the states that we talked about earlier. Alertness, alert, waking, and crying. So those first three, um, those first three to four months, that one hour, they're going to be alert, they're going to be having being waking, and they're going to be crying. So that's a lot to happen in an hour, and then they're asleep again. Now, every baby doesn't follow completely like this, but this is the cycle of a newborn. At three or four months, babies begin to sleep five to six hours straight. So that's when you're like, yay, my baby's sleeping. <laughs> mothers, mothers, caregivers start to get some relief. What age do you think babies, um, on average, start sleeping through the night? So research has found it's about six months, and that's about 10 to 12 hours. Okay, so the big thing you want to know about newborn sleep is that newborns sleep a lot. They have a cyclic sleep schedule and they start sleeping through the night at um, about six months, which is 10 to 12 hours. During that first three to four months, they have three hours of sleep to one hour of awake. And when they're awake, they go through those three states we talked about, alert, waking and crying. And then about three to four months, they begin to sleep about five to six hours straight. 
So if we want to go back to talking about the newborn sleep cycle, half of the newborn sleep is irregular, with rapid eye movement, REM. And then usually you'll see that with arms and legs moving or the eyes under the eyelids kind of fluttering. So just like we go into REM, they do too. So, um, but half, half of their sleep is irregular. So they don't have the same cycle as we do, uh, but they do have some kind of cycle. So remember that half of the newborn sleep is irregular in that rapid eye movement sleep. And you can know that when their arms and legs are moving uh, under, or under their eyelid not when they're completely still. So the other half of sleep time is in regular, non-REM sleep pattern. So the breathing, heart rate, and brain activity are steady. The body is still. So remember, if the body is still, non-REM regular, and if the child is moving his arms and legs, you see a little flutter of their eyes, they're in that REM sleep. So a little bit about REM sleep. They found that in, they found in studies that's where adult and older children dream. And with these studies, they found that during this state, brain waves stimulate brain growth and healing, and especially the neurological system. So you can understand why a baby is, spends half their time in REM's uh, dream state, because they have huge development of their brain and neurological system that needs to be developed in these first, uh, first year. So just remember that REM is that dreamlike state that stimulates brain growth and healing, especially the neurological system. REM sleep drops to about 25% by the first birthday. So the first year, you know, when they're first born, they're, they spend half their time in it. By uh, one year old, they're only spending 25%. And by the time they hit an adult, we spend about 20% of our sleep time in REM. So you can see it doesn't take very long for them to get close to being an adult time. So you can imagine that so much is happening development-wise in that first uh, year because they're spending half of their time in that REM where they're developing all those neurological and develop brain development. Another thing I want to talk to you about is sudden infant death syndrome, syndrome which is SIDS, and it can occur in a baby's sleep. It's a sudden death of an apparently healthy baby and it happens in one to three American babies out of a thousand. So some of the theories of why this happens, uh, they feel like that it's particularly vulnerable between two to four months of age, since many newborn reflexes are waning and infants may not respond effectively when breathing becomes difficult. So they may not, so if they roll onto their stomach, you know, they may have a reflex that um, they may not be able to get out of it. They may not be able to roll back onto their back. So they move their head away from a blanket or pillow that is smothering them. They may not be able to do that, but they kind of reflexively move into that, but they're still not able to move out of it. So they're in that transition period of the reflex going away, but not completely, so they, they can't control the movement out of it. Some risk, risk factors for SIDS is age, so two to four months of age. Premature and low birth weight. So if you're born prematurely or have a low birth weight, like we talked last chapter, having parents who smoke, sleeping face down rather than on the back, having too many blankets or sleepwear, babies can become overheated easily. Uh, and the reason that you don't want them to be face down is because if they turn their head, they can't get out of it, right? We talked about those reflexes and not being able to reflexively go in the position, but they can't voluntarily get out of it. So a program that was that was developed to, to help uh, counter these risk factors for SIDS, and this is through research, one of your research, human developed research designs in action, is Back to Sleep program. And it has decreased SIDS by 50%. Um, and SIDS is the leading cause of death in one to 12 month year old babies. So it is the number one reason why babies die in their first year. So it, this back to sleep program promotes keeping babies away from smoke, having firm mattresses, backs to the sleep. So that's to remember to lay on your back, back to sleep, not overdressing or wrapping too tightly in blankets. And that is the back to sleep program, 50% decrease in SIDS death, which is the leading cause of death in 
the first year of life. All right, so now we're going to look at babies and how they act. Think of all the children you've seen, all the newborns, all the different ages. Do they all act the same? Probably not. Just as we are individuals, babies have different temperaments. We've all heard the saying, oh, they were, you were a wonderful baby. Did your mom tell you you were a wonderful baby? Oh, your brother was awful, right? So what is that? Why do babies have, you know, have different temperaments? So let's look at it. What is a temperament? Temperament is a consistent style or pattern of behavior. And according to Rothbard, there are three dimensions of temperament. You have surgency or extroversion. And this is when an infant is generally happy, active, and vocal. So that's your, your happy baby. That's like, oh, that was my perfect baby. You have negative affect. That's angry, fearful, shy, not easily soothed. So we all have those babies that don't like strangers, you know, that are fearful of everything, grasp on you. They cry. You can't get them to stop crying. And then you have effortful control. They can focus attention not readily distracted and can inhibit responses. And they found that temperament in babies um, is definitely related to personality later in life. So as we go and study some of the development later in life, we'll be looking at how was their temperament as a baby? How, oh, I can see that their temperament was like that. I can understand a little bit why they are who they are now. So I want you to think of all the babies that you have. Think about the ones that cry all the time, right? They had colic and some that cry infrequently. That's what we're thinking about with temperament. Temperament can emerge in infancy and relate to personality and behavior later in life. They found that newborns who cry under moderate stress are more likely to at five months cry with any stressful situation. So if they, if you had a hard baby at five months, then you just a little, you know, a little bit to, Medium stress, when they hit five months, any type of stress is going to make them more likely to cry. So temperament definitely plays a factor in development um, as you develop to the other stages of your life. Several factors that can affect temperament is heredity. So they found with identical twin studies that identical twins usually have similar temperaments. Um, negative affect is more influenced by heredity. So if you're having more of that negative affect um, characteristics, being angry, shy, not able to soothe, that's more heredity. So that's more likely if you, you know, pass down if your mom, from your dad, if they were like that, you're more likely to have that. And young temper children's temperaments are more influenced by heredity than infants. So um, infants can vary more on their environment, you know, if they're wet, dirty, tired, hungry, but young children more on the, you know, the heredity. So if they're genetically was passed, you're going to see, you're going to see that more set in as um, younger children, but infants are definitely more on the stimulus or the environment. Um, so if we're thinking about environment, what are some of the things that uh, would be envir would be environmental influences to these young infants and babies? First one is a mother's depression can cause an infant to be fearful. So if the mom is sad and depressed and does not interact with their baby, they're not going to build that trust. And so in turn, it causes the baby to be fearful because they, they fear that, that their needs are not going to be met. They're not going to be, the moms usually, if they're depressed, they're not attentive. They may cry for a long period of time. So they may stay in a soiled diaper. They may not get fed when they want to. So it starts to develop that fearfulness that can continue in later stages. And babies' temperaments differ in general from culture to culture. So what does that mean? So depending on the environment, depending on where you're raised, influences your temperament. Studies have found that Asian babies are less emotional than European American babies. Uh, infants are less emotional when parents are responsible, are responsive. So like we talked about, um, if you're meeting the needs of your child, then your baby's less likely to cry or it's less likely, it's, it's more likely to feel trust and secure. So it's, it's less likely to have, uh, be more emotional. It's more likely to be less emotional because its needs are being met. And Asian babies uh, tend to be less emotional just on the culture that they're raised in. So I want you to think about, why do you think that? Think about that as you're looking through this. Why do different cultures um, 
how does different cultures environments affect temperament? So now we're going to look at another part of development, physical growth, biological, right? That's a part of development. So body growth. So not only is we're going to be doing a lot of developing in the child, we're going to be growing as well, right? So that child, that little newborn infant's going to do its most growing in this time. So height increases 50% by H1, 75% by H2, weight doubles by three months, triples by a year, individual and group um, differences in size and rate of growth, and fastest growth than any time during their lifespan. This rate is so rapid that if you continued throughout your childhood, say you kept growing at this rate, a typical 10-year-old would be nearly as long as a jumbo jet and weigh almost as much. So this rate, you know, we grow the most we're ever going to grow in our uh, first two years. So just remember that and some of the statistics in here, okay? So this is a growth uh, chart. So many... You have seen this if you've had children. Uh, if not, this is what they show you when you're, you see where your child is on the um, percentile, how they compare to other children of their same age. So you can see that the uh, we have age on the bottom and then we have length on and weight. So you can see what uh, percentile you're, you're in. So boys and girls grow taller and heavier from birth to three years of age but the range of normal heights and weights is quite wide. So you can have definitely a quite a different range. So you can show there's the 90th, 50th, and 10th percentile. So if you fall on the 90th percentile, you are, uh, like so in the length, you're taller than 90% of the people in your age group. If you're on the 10th, you're 90% of the people are taller than you in your same age group. But you can see, look at where um, 90 we look at all these different changes. It's a wide group. It's a range. So as long as if you're on the high spectrum or really on the low spectrum, your doctor might tell the child they need to change some things, but they're just looking at a range. Okay. So this is just going to show you that, that range. And they, you want to look at it and you can see one size girls and one size boys, but you want to think of it like I 90th percentile. That means that you are taller or way more than 90% of the people in your uh, age. And if you're in a 10th percentile, 90% of the people way more than you in your same age group. So those are the growth and, um, and body charts. Now let's look at growth trends and changes in body proportions. So I want you to remember that infants are not simply scaled down versions of adults. When you look at an infant, do they, are they proportionate like we are? What are the big things that you notice? Well, they look top heavy because their heads and trunks, their heads and trunks are disproportionately large, right? And their arms or legs are going to grow. <laughs> so as they grow, their hips, legs, and feet catch up and look more like adults. So they're very top and trunk heavy with, you know, smaller arms and legs. So you want to remember that they grow cephalocaudal, head to tail. So that's a good medical terminology word there. They go head to tail. Lower part of body grows later than the head. So the head grows first and then the lower body. And they grow proximal, distal, which that means near to far. So they grow closer to the body and then at the farther away from the body. So extremities grow later than the head, chest, and trunk. So you just want to remember that the head and the trunk grows faster and um, grows first. So that's uh, cephalocaudal and proximal distal. And the extremities are your arms and legs. They grow later than the head and they grow later than the chunk, chest and trunk as well. So I want you to remember body growth requires 40% of a young infant's body energy. That's why they need to eat and have a lot of nutrition. That's why they eat a lot. They should ingest 50 calories per pound of body weight. And breast milk is the best way to ensure proper nourishment. So what are some of the advantages of breastfeeding over bottle feeding? Let's take a look at so number one, 
Breastfeeding gives the proper amount of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals for babies. It's perfectly genetically made to nourish a baby. It has all the proper balances uh, in that milk. So they don't have to worry about, am I getting enough fats? Am I getting a balance of all the nutrients? It's perfectly balanced and made for that infant baby nutrition. Number two, the baby's ill less often since it contains the mother's antibodies to protect illnesses. Babies are very vulnerable to common colds because they can't take all the medications like adults. So the mother is able to pass their antibodies, some of their, their protection to the baby. So, the, so breastfed babies are ill less, less often. Number three, they're less prone to diarrhea and constipation because again, that proper perfect mix of balance of carbohydrate, fats, proteins, it metabolizes, it digests easily so that they're less, to, less prone to diarrhea and constipation. They, number four, they transition to solid food more easily because they are more accustomed to changes in the taste of breast milk with the mother's diet. So whatever the mother eats is gonna affect how the breast milk tastes. So because they don't get the same taste every time they have the breast milk, they're already starting to try new things. They're already exposed to the different flavors. So when they transition, it's an easier transition because of that. They are already looking to see that things taste differently. Number, number five is breast milk cannot be contaminated. So this is a, a huge problem in countries where there are uh, unclean water. So is that water is used for make formula and then that whatever's if the water is not clean, then it's passed on into the baby. So a significant problem in developing countries with poor water supply for formula. So it's recommended that you breastfeed for the first year with solid food introduced gradually. You want to introduce cereals, then vegetables, fruits, and then meats. So you want to kind of gradually with a um, transition into easier textures, um, flavors that are a little bit milder, and then sweets and then meats so that the uh, the digestion is easier and it's a gradual uh, combination. And you want to do one food at a time to check for allergies so that you know if you introduce a strawberry, you know if that child breaks out that the strawberry is causing the food. You don't want to introduce too many foods so you can't tell what is actually causing if there is an allergic reaction. So what are some advantages of bottle fed? So think back about the bonding of the parents. Well, the, the dad can feed the baby and create intimacy, right? And other people can create that intimacy too. And it can actually give you, you know, rest to the, the mother and create that dynamic. So although they recommend breastfeeding and they have, you know, the five reasons, so those are important. Proper amount of carbohydrates, perfect balance. He's got the perfect nutrient balance. Pass the antibodies from the mom. Less prone to diarrhea and constipation. Transition to solid food because they're used to different tasting bread, breast milk. Breast milk can't be contaminated because the water, um, whereas bottle can be contaminated, the water source is not good. But and, but bottle fed can you know create intimacy and create the bond with other uh, caregivers and the dad. And just remember that 60% um, of the bodily function for an infant is used for digestion and respiration and the small portion of physical activity, right? Because they're not super active in their infant. So just breathing and digesting, 60% of their, their food intake is used for that. And just remember that growth slows by the age of two, so children uh, need to eat, eat less. And they, you, that's when you may begin to see those picky eaters because they don't need the food for, they don't need as much nutrients. They're not growing as, as rapidly. Remember those first two years, they grow very, very rapidly pace. So usually that 18 months to two years, you're going to see those picky eaters come. I know I have a picky eater in about 18 months. She came on. Uh, two is the average. So uh, now you can kind of see that phys physiological development. They're starting to choose their own what they like and what they don't like. So now we want to talk a little bit about malnourished. One in four children worldwide under the age of five is malnourished. That's a lot. That's 25% of the world is is, uh, is now nourished under five. So that has huge effects on your development because if you're not getting nutrients, what is not growing properly? 
the brain. The brain needs nutrients, proteins, all that to grow and develop properly. And that can affect long-term long -term, uh, development. So usually when you see a malnourished child, they're small for their age because they're not growing because they don't have the nutrients to grow. And 15% of American households have difficulty at some point in providing adequate food for all family members. So maybe you know you've experienced it, maybe you know somebody, but that's a pretty big statistics um, for not having food. And, you know, that's pretty, I mean, that that's you know, really sad in this, in this um, country that we have still 15% of people that don't have adequate food for all family members. So that makes a huge impact on their development. And it's especially damaging during infancy because remember, that's when everything, all that, that's huge physical and growth development of that's the body and the brain. So it results in children who are small for their age, it damages the brain and affects learning, and it leads to lethargy, which in return leads to parent, parental neglect. So what does that look like for that child that was malnourished under five? What do they look like when they hit school age, you know, when they go to school? Because this may be the first time an outsider sees them. So some things to be aware of is that malnourished infants tend to be school-aged children who are easily distracted, since rapid growth of the brain, important for de development of learning and attention, occurs during this time. And because they're adapt, they, their brains adapt to conserve energy because they don't have enough food, they don't develop, that brain doesn't develop as well. And because they're conserving this energy, they're not interacting with their environment as much, they're not getting this exper experiment, experiences and stimulation, which other children who are properly nourished. So because they're not getting the environmental stimulus to, you know, to interact with their environment, to learn and to make those neural connections, you're going to see a less developed brain possibly when they're school age. They may, they may have less attention. And because the child is not engaged because they're malnourished, uh, the, the parent then may not be engaged with them. So you have that less of that, uh, you kind of see some of that parental neglect because the child isn't stimulating the parent to like, pay attention to me, give me stimulus, give me this, they're quiet. So you have me, you can think about it, right? That quiet, the child's just quiet, nothing's wrong with it. So the parent's like, oh, they're fine, I'm gonna let them be. Where at that age, they need to be, have interaction, they need to have that stimulus. So it's, it's that biological influence uh, that creates that parental neglect cycle. So the lethargy stemming from insufficient nourishment causes a, pro a profound change in the experiences, which is that parental teaching because the child isn't seeking attention, the parent doesn't give it, and because they don't have that, that cycle continues, and so that brain doesn't have all the experiences to develop and make those neural connections. And that affects the child's overall development. So we need to improve diet and foster programs that teach parents how to foster child's development. We need to address biological and social cultural forces. So that's one way that they interact. And they're important to understand that just the basics of being nourished and providing that, that food and nutrients to the brain allows that, that stimulus for the child to engage with their parent and then it allows the parent to then engage back and it creates those experiences that allows the brain to have more neural connections and it improves their development for into their childhood and beyond. So we've talked a lot about brain and development and all that stuff that happens between zero and two because that brain is just laying down the foundation, laying down all that software for future development. So let's go a little, let's go over what is happening and what is exactly the parts of the brain that is developing. So let's think of the basic structures of the brain. We're gonna look at the neurons and their connective fibers. So a neuron is a nerve cell that stores and transmits information. So that's like the, the center, that's that hardware, that's, that's the main worker of the nervous system is those neurons all connecting. The cell body is the center of that cell, so it's the center of the neuron, and it contains material to keep the neuron alive. And then the dendrites are the receiving end of the neuron, and it receives information from the neurons. And just remember that the neuron is the basic unit in the brain and the rest of the nervous system. 
It spells, it's a cell specialized for receiving and transmitting information. So when you think of the brain, the most basic unit is that neuron. We're going to talk a little bit more and look at pictures to understand the full picture on the next slide. So a couple more terms to understand is the axon. It's a tube-like structure that transmits information to the neurons. So it's what connects. It's the, I consider it when I try to explain it to patients is this, it is the wire. It's that live wire. If you want to connect, you know, the neurons to neurons, it's the axon. So if you're like if you have a live wire in your wall and you cut it, you you can't communicate to the electricity, can't communicate to, you know, your lamp to turn on. Same thing. That's what the axon is. It's that wire that communicates from the two neurons. Your terminal buttons at the end of each axon are little small knobs which release chemicals, and those chemicals tell it what to do. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that are released by neurons that carry information to other nearby neurons. So that is what the chemicals are. So the neurotransmitters are um, in, or what is, is the chemical that's inside those terminal buttons. And depending on what type of neurotransmitter is, it's going to tell the next neuron what to do. So we're going to look at a picture of it and it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. So this is the picture of all those terms we were talking about. The brain and nervous system accomplishes many changes during infancy, and this is the basic structure and how it how it does. So you're going to form. You can see you can see the cell body right there in the middle that we talked about, and so that big um, circle on the left is your neuron. The cell body is in the is right there. You see that axon. Remember that's your wire. That's I call it the live wire. That's connecting. Uh, information and sending it out to the next neuron. Uh, you have your dendrites on there that uh, are taking information in, and then you have your terminal buttons with those little chemicals, neurotransmitters, that's giving information. So if you could picture this, on the other side of that terminal button is another cell body where you see those dendrites, and they would take in the information coming from those terminal buttons. So remember, there are 50 billion to 100 billion neurons that make up the adult brain, right? That's insane. Like we have so many neurons, so many connections. So can you imagine if you're an infant, zero to two, you're not nourished correctly, you're not stimulated correctly, that you're not going to make those connections. So the way that the brain develops is the more you stimulate it, the more those axons spring out and make connections and the more information you can pass and the more you learn. So a stimulated brain, that's why it's so important, even childhood, after injury, after stroke. Uh, when I treat a stroke, that's why we get in there really, really early, because the more you stimulate it, the more you keep those connections going. And if you're not nourishing the brain to keep the, the neurons healing, and you're not stimulating it to keep those axons communicating, they will die off. So that's why it's very important in infants because they are just building it. They're actually building the blocks. So if they don't have the building blocks to do it, so you can imagine at 10, if they hadn't laid down that foundation, they don't have that axon that can carry that information. They haven't uh, developed it. So that's why they can have so much difficulty. So just a recap, a nerve cell includes dendrites that receive information. A cell body has life-sustaining machinery, so that keeps everything alive. That's where that nutrient come in and keep that cell working and for sending information an axon that ends in terminal buttons so that's the loop so just to recap terminal buttons release the neurotransmitters that carry information to other neurons and then the dendrites from that that cell body take that information and pass it along and we process it and make sense of it in the brain so neurons make up the brain so you have different parts of the brain, and each brain, each part of the brain has a, spe a specific function. So let's go over that a little bit. So you have the brain, and it's made of 50 to 100 billion neurons, but each of those neurons are specialized to do some specific activity depending on the region it is in the brain. So the cerebral cortex, so that's the region of the brain that controls higher level, distinctly human thinking. That's where you do all your your uh, high-level thinking. It consists of a right and left hemisphere joined by the corpus callosum. So that's the middle little bridge in between that helps connect the two sides where they can communicate. 
the frontal cortex located at the front of the cerebral cortex. And we will look at a picture on the next slide. That I want you to think of when you think of frontal, I want you to think of personality and executive functions largely centered here. So if I was to see a brain injured person and they had damaged their frontal cortex, a lot of times what I'll see in that patient is their judgment will be impaired. They won't have that filter. We call it the filter where you say, oh, I process that information, but I know not to say certain things. They say whatever is on their mind. Uh, they have no social cues. A lot of times they're very impulsive. They don't, they do things that are very dangerous because they don't have that self-regulating, uh, this might hurt me, this might hurt someone else's feelings if I say this. It's all that executive function where you just kind of know what's appropriate and your personality. A lot of times you'll see someone that's had injured that, that they may start cussing or saying foul language and they would never ever say that in their regular life. So it's just basically you can kind of change your your filter, your personality a little bit, that's the frontal co cortex, that judgment. When we, you know, how we keep ourselves in um, safe and judge and not be impulsive and, and regulate ourselves in that, that's the frontal cortex. So these are two pictures of the brain. So the one on the left is a real brain and that one's a picture. So you can see it looks kind of like you've got soci and gyrus and stuff in it. All that is made up of all those billions of neur neurons. So the brain on the left is viewed from the above and it shows the left and right hemispheres. The brain on the right viewed from the, the side shows the major reasons of the cortex and their primary function. And I want you to remember that each side, there are specific places that do specific things. So remember personality, way with words, emotion is frontal cortex. And now you can see um, it's labeled right there. Understanding language is the left hemisphere. Recognition of emotions, happy or sad, are in the right hemisphere. So if you have a stroke or some kind of injury to that side, it matters where the location and what side it is because it's going to affect language in a different area. Uh, it can affect emotions, it can affect your weakness. Left side of the brain is mostly responsible for language and speech and is considered dominant. And the right hemisphere is larger, largely responsible for visual and spatial processing along with emotions. So I don't know if you've ever heard of, are you a right brain thinker or a left brain thinker, you know? Um, if you're very analytical, you tend to be left side. If you're very creative, maybe you're more dominant, more connections on the right side. Uh, so it does matter what side it, it's on. and there's a one side of the brain is mostly language. You can have, um, you can see in the temporal cortex, you have hearing and visual processing. In the parietal cortex, that's more body sensations. And then back in the back of your head is the occipital lobe and we think of vision. Uh, and below that, it's not labeled, but you see the cerebellum and you think of balance. And then the on that um, drawing on the very bottom under there is the brainstem that controls all our breathing and heart rate and automatic autonomic functions those automatic functions so again here's the uh, picture of the lobes of the brain and we're going to do a quick rundown just so you can really um, hammer this in so we see that frontal lobe and that's personality behavior emotions judgment planning problem solving you see speech right there that speech speaking and writing so if you're going to talk and you're going to write that's Broca's area Production of speech left side of the brain. You have body movement, which is the motor strip you can see right there. And intelligence, concentration, and self-awareness. Then we're going to move back into the parietal lobe. And you're going to see that interprets language and words. You have a sense of touch, pain, temperature. That's that sensory strip. So you can see all that is in orange. And what that does is interpret signals from vision, hearing, motor, sensory, and memory. Spatial and visual perception. So that's what that basically means is knowing when something's, when you're upright or when you're um, upside down, you're, you're um, relative to, to space. So if things, if you get really have like vertigo and stuff and you can't tell where, you, if you're upside down or what's up and what's down, that's that spatial and visual perception. And the parietal lobe is interpret. So you, so the frontal cortex, what happens is they hear the words or 
that the parietal lobe interprets it, makes sense of it. So I know, like, so if they have a stroke or some kind of injury in there, a lot of times you're going to see what's called aphasia. So you have expressive aphasia, uh, which is in the Broca's area, and it's a type of aphasia characterized by partial loss of ability to produce language. So they can't say it. So they understand what you're saying, but they can't. It's the physical act of speaking. So they can't speak, but they understand exactly what you're saying. They, the words come out jumbled. They might say yes for no. Um, they might. It makes no sense. And that could be in written as well. So it's if they try to write it, it's no better because it's the way they express it. And that's in Broca's area. But you can, but they understand everything you're saying. So the other type of aphasia is what's called receptive aphasia, and that's Wernicke's area. So if we think about it, that is the opposite. And we would think that they have difficulty understanding. So they can say the words. They may not make sense because they aren't understanding what you're saying. So they can say words, and words are, you know, come out of their mouths right and all that stuff, but they don't understand a word that you're saying or very little understanding what you're saying. Because if we understand the parietal lobe, that's what interprets language. So if it's coming in there and you have damage there, they may hear the words, they may hear the sounds, and they can make the sounds and, and repeat the words, but they don't understand. There's no processing it and putting meaning to the words. So that's the difference. So it depends on where there's injury. So that's why it's important to know the lobes of the brain or then where if there's damage to it to be able to identify, oh, they're having difficulty understanding me. They must have some kind of damage in that Wernicke's area of the brain, which is in the parietal lobe. And we go on to look at the occipital lobe. Again, it interprets vision, color, light, and movement, and it's the back. So it comes through, and so it makes meaning to what your eyes uh, take in. The sensory part comes in through your eyes. It sends the information back to your occipital lobe, and it processes it to make sense. So the colors make sense. The That's a person. You know, all that makes sense. So if you have damage there and you may have visual deficits, they may, they may not be interpreting exactly what they're seeing. So I always say sometimes you can't trust what your brain is telling you right now because it's damaged. You can't trust the information. It's not processing right. And then the temporal lobe, which we talked a little bit about with the Wernicke area, it's down there. And that's the understanding of language, understanding of speech, memory, and hearing. So if you have damage there, you may have memory problems or you may have difficulty hearing. So now we're going to specifically look at the exact areas of that prefrontal cortex that you can see damage. So if you see damage in the emotional or lack of development in the um, brown areas, then you're going to see impaired emotional responses. Lack of development or damage in the green, impaired attention. Lack of development or, or uh, damage in the blue, behavior and judgment. So. The brain is very intricate, has very, even in itself, has very, very specific areas within the, the cortexes that relate to behavior, you know, specific behaviors or specific motor or sensory loss. So that's why it's important when they look at those MRIs and CAT scans, they see exactly where it is because they can kind of predict what the physical uh, manifestations are going to be. So saying that, just remember that the motor strip depending on the side and the location on that motor strip is where you're going to see weakness. So remember that the opposite side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So if you have a, a damage or lack of development on the right side, you can see you're going to see weakness on the left and vice versa. If that's on the left side of the brain, you're going to see weakness on the right. The only time that that doesn't happen is higher up in the eyes because they don't cross and you'll see unilateral um, vision problems, but that's more for neuroanatomy. But just remember, and then also on the motor strip, it kind of, it, it didn't show in these pictures, but it'll show each part of the strip, just like you see each part of that prefrontal cortex has a specific part of the behavior. Same thing on the motor strip. You have a part, the little part of the brain that has the hand, the head, the arm, the leg. So depending on that, where that damage or that lack of development is, you may just have arm weakness and not leg weakness if it's very pinpoint. So even in itself, it's very specialized. The brain's very specialized, very 
specialized areas and control. So if they do that imaging, they can really, and the better the imaging, like PET scans much more higher, they can actually see, okay, that damage is right then. If you look at that precortex, you know, prefrontal cortex and attention, I expect to see a, a attention problems. So now that we understand the basics of the nervous system, the neuron, the brain, axons, and how they communicate, let's take a look back and think about how they initially developed. So we're going to go back to that prenatal development, but we're going to look at it through uh, the nervous system lens. So you're going to first, how do we form the brain and the spinal cord? Well, it all starts with a neural plate. And that is a flat group of cells in the zygote period. So remember, that's right when, um, right after conception, that's that first phase of that traveling down the tube to come uh, implant on the uterus. So you have a flat group of cells in the zygote that eventually becomes the brain and the spinal cord. So let's take a look at that time frame. At about three weeks, the neural plate is formed. At four weeks, the neural plate will form a tube. That's the tube that's eventually going to become the spinal cord. And when the end of the tube fuses shut, neurons are produced in one small region. So just think it kind of it shuts down and then all this becomes a neuron factory in the small little region in the neural tube. Neuron factory in the neural tube, producing all the neurons you're going to have for the rest of your life. Production of neurons begins about 10 weeks after conception. So after that 10 weeks, it's just producing, producing, producing. And at about 28 weeks, all the neurons are formed. So in 18 weeks of prenatal development, you're going to have all the neurons you're going to have for the rest of your life. So you can understand why it's so important to have good prenatal care and good development prenatally, because if not, and the brain does not get that, that function, that development early on, you're going to have long-term effect through the whole life of that child. So let's take a look at the brain in stages. So you have neuron manufacturing sites. So remember, you got that neural tube closed. It's just man, a little factory making all your neurons. Uh, that, you're gonna, that is going to migrate down the tube to their final position. So you've got all those little neuron cells that are going to migrate down now to their final position. Neurons that are deepest form first. And that makes sense. The deeper they are, they form first. Then the next layer until all six layers are formed by seven months after conception. So at about seven months prenatally, you're going to have the six layers of your neurons. At four months of prenatal development, you're going to start seeing the axons. So remember, the axons are the, the live wire that carries information from neuron to neuron. And they're going to begin to acquire myelin. So myelin is a fatty wrap that speeds neural transmission. So if you're thinking of that example, and I always think of axon as that live wire that's going to, remember, connect to two neurons, just like you would connect the electricity from your um, motherboard in your house to your lamp. That myelin is that, if you've ever seen a wire, it has that sheath that has the, like the black tubing around it. And what that does is it helps speed the, the um, electricity, makes the electricity go faster. That's what myelin does for your, your axons, makes the information travel faster so you can react faster, helps with processing. So when you think of speed and neural transmission, think of processing. Getting information there quicker so you can make decisions and react quicker. So process continues through infancy into childhood and adulthood. So we're always making connections. We can make more connections, keep connections, lose connections, but we're always stimulating the brain and it can always learn things. So months after birth, axons and dendrites grow longer and mature like a tree quickly sprouting new limbs. So you have all the neurons you're ever going to have at 28 weeks, but you're going to make you're going to make axons and connections through your whole life. And the more you stimulate and the more engaging you are, the, the longer they'll stay there, the more you make. And the less you are, some will die out, and you just may not make as many connections. So that's the key. That's why it's so important to stimulate and to learn and provide environments for ch young children, adults, older adults, because we, we need to keep those axons communicating, or they'll just die out. So as dendrites, so remember dendrites is on the neuron. It's what receives the information. So dendrites is like the, the catcher. It's receiving the information. It's receiving the ball. Um, so does the synapses. So the synapses are the little things that um, take the information in. And that peaks at their first birthday. Then they disappear. So they synaptic pruning. So what that basically means is you're going to make connections 
first all that you need to learn. You need to learn, you know, to do basic skills. And then maybe after that, I don't need to learn that basic skill anymore. I'm advanced. So I don't need to learn how to, you know, to do little specific movements, maybe, you know, with my, uh, you know, my mouse, my tongue, whatever, whatever it is. I'm, kind of, I'm more advanced. So that axon might die. It's called synap synaptic pruning. Um, the brain downsizes because it becomes more efficient. So uh, that basic skill I don't need. So I'm going to lose that connection because I've got a more advanced skill. You know, maybe I was learning how just to like touch something, but now I can touch and grab and grasp all together. So I have more of an advanced skill. Synaptic pruning is I'm getting rid of the connections that I don't need anymore because my brain is becoming efficient so I can process faster and I can um, in interact with my environment faster. So it's getting rid of the non-active synapses. So now let's look at general principles of brain specialization during a child's development. So specialization is evident early on. Many areas specialize in early infancy, right? They need language processing is in the left hemisphere. They're gonna learn their language. They're gonna learn specific words, gestures, specializes early on. And it takes two forms. Active brain regions become more focused and stimuli responsible for brain activity shift from general to specific. So what are some examples of that? So active brain regions become more focused. So what that means is when a child infant first sees you, it can just kind of ch see that you're a human. It can't tell where the head, it sees a body. It can't tell that it's a head, arms, or legs, it just sees a body. And then as it starts to specialize, it starts to say, okay, I can tell that's the head, that's the arm, that's the body. So that is the active brains became more focused. That would be an example. A stimuli responsible for brain activity, and this is the um, area of the brain, is the fusiform gyrus, temporal occipital gyrus. Remember I said that temporal area is for sensory and spatial perception. So now that's what's used for facial recognition. And what that means is now they can look at a, a face instead at first they'll just see a face. They can't tell if it's their mom, if it's their dad, if it's a stranger. But as that specialization continues, they're going to have what's called facial recognition. They can tell that, no, that's my mom. I, I know what my mom looks like. I can tell that's her eyes, her nose. I can tell the difference. I'm getting very specific. Not just a general face, it's specific. So active brain regions become more focused. That's large to small. They can tell it's more than just the body. The body has parts. And stimuli responsible is, is that um, general to specific. So it's not just anybody coming in. I know that's my mom. I know that's my grandma because I can tell their facial recognition. And this doesn't happen all at the same time. So different brain systems specialize at different rates. So basic sensory systems develop faster. So basic sensory and perceptual processes specialize before regions necessary for higher order processing. So that makes sense, right? You need to be able to take in the world. So you need to be able to understand your environment before you can before you can have a higher thought on it so you need to be able to touch and know what a person is in space you need to understand how that um you know how a block stands up how it moves that sensory processing before you can understand that you know what gravity is how it doesn't fall over so those are kind of extreme examples but you need to know sensory and perception how to take in your environment before you can actually have an opinion on your environment so some brain systems don't reach full matur maturity until adolescence, which would be the reward system in, and, or adulthood, which would be self-control. And we'll talk about this later on as we go through those sections of the semester. But remember that those are still developing. So the brain is always developing to a certain age, and we're going to hit those milestones as we go. But um, just some basic concepts on how it specializes in those areas that we talked earlier, uh, the different parts of the brain. So it specializes in a, in a specific way and, a, and, it's, and it specializes at different rates. And sensory information is processed and specialized before we have higher learning on it, right? A kid takes in and understands that fire burns before they exact, understand exactly how to make fire, right? So think of that. So successful specialization requires stimulation from the environment. Experience expectant growth. Wiring of the brain is organized by human experiences. 
So we know that they have all the neurons and unless they are in an environment that stimulates in those connections, that they are not going to grow in the way that they need to. They're not going to have that foundation. They're not going to learn how to do those activities that can affect later development. And an immature's brain's lack of specialization confers a benefit, greater plasticity. So young children can recover brain skills lost due to injury more easily than older children and adults. And uh, they've done surgeries actually on very young children, maybe two and younger, where they maybe one part of the brain was completely uh, damaged and they had to take out the half of the brain. But because that other brain, half of the brain hasn't become specialized yet, with uh, therapy and stimulation, they can teach that brain through plasticity because plasticity is that change, you know, the ability to change. They can start um, teaching it new specializations because it hasn't laid down all its specializations. Those neurons are open to interpretation. So with young children like that, the neurons are just making those connections. So because they haven't had a full on connection and they're not specialized yet, you can actually teach the brain, you know, get full speech back, full motor where you have half of the brain. It's amazing. It's incredible because the neurons are just open to, you know, that environment and that, that stimuli that's going to specialize the activity. So it's pretty darn amazing. And that plasticity in the brain continued all the way in through adulthood. So when I see stroke patients and they've lost part of their brain, I'm stimulating and I'm working on getting that plasticity, the brain to change and pull back some of that normal movement. So just remember that plasticity in the children is at its highest in that zero to two, that young infant is when you can, it has not specialized yet. So if you have damage, you can just stimulate the brain and those connections and tell the brain now this is the area you're going to specialize in. So remember newborn brains has the preliminary neural pathways to perform functions. So it's all set like a kind of a uh, blueprint, right? We always talk about the blueprint. Um, in the left hemisphere, there's some language and in the frontal, there's cortex or emotion. So then as you start stimulating emotions, that's kind of where the section is. Think of your computer. That's the emotion section. It's going to start specializing and creating connections for that. So it needs the environment to mature and develop it. So if you don't get a lot of emotional, like you don't have any emotion, well, emotion and support and comfort in your home, you're not going to have a lot of connection. So as you can see that child that maybe doesn't have that emotional connection and you can think, okay, maybe when they were a young infant, zero to two, even a young child, they didn't get that attention. They didn't make those pathways. So they having difficulty now because they didn't have that specialization when they were young. So remember, environment strengthens some field for growth and eliminates some for need and some not needed. So that's that synapsic pruning. Your brain becomes very efficient. It's the most amazing thing you can have. So as you get more skills and as you develop um, higher level movement, high level thinking, it gets rid of that lower level that you don't need anymore so that you become efficient, you react and you think faster. The environment exposed will affect the strength of those connections. So depending on how much what you're exposed to, what you're stimulated is, will affect that, how well you specialize, how well you are processing. So, so important, if I can stress anything, between zero to two is really engage that child in a multiple of um, stimuli so they can make all these connections because it will lay the groundwork for all the development as they reach childhood into adult. Now let's talk about the movement part, motor skills. So they're going to learn a lot of motor skills, right? They do nothing to or, or, um, running by two. So let's say that progression. So what are motor skills? Motor skills are coordinated movements of the muscles and limbs. And infants learn to move about in their world. So how do they interact with their environment? How do they move? Fine motor skills are associated with smaller muscle groups. They're associated with grasping, holding, and manipulating objects. So why is that important? Well, basic stuff, feeding, right? They need to hold a bottle, hold utensils, etc. Those are all fine motor skills. So those are some of the things in your discussion group you're going to be talking about. How do we teach parents to play? We're talking about all the stimulus in the environment. So how do we play with our children to encourage all this good synaptic development, right? So that's going to be our discussion group. How do we have purposeful play? And one of the activities is going to be fine motor. How do you, what kind of activities can you do to stimulate that? So we'll, 
you'll, I have some videos uh, in this section that you'll be watching to to think about that. But you want to think, how do I do that? How do I get that uh, holding a bottle and utensils? So motor development, sequence and trends. Let's look at some, how does motor development um, go? So gross motor development is crawling, standing, walking. Those are those big mo movements, big muscle groups. Fine motor development is reaching and grasping. And the sequence is fairly uniform. So a largely individual differences in rate of motor progression. So we're going to look at that. So looking at this figure, you're going to see what are the milestones in gross motor development. So what should you expect? It's, it's always remember it's a range uh, for that child to be doing. So by the first month, it should be able to lay it on your stomach and um, lift its head. So prone, lift its head. Prone is on your stomach. By um, from two to about four and a half months, you're going to go prone to chest up. So fully on their arms. By four and a half months, they should be able to roll over. By about six and a half months, they should support some weight through their legs. By about seven and a half months, they should sit, not supported. About almost 10 months, they should be able to stand with, with support. So like we call it like, you know, like standing on the couch or holding on to something. And they should also be able to pull themselves to stand. About 12 and a half months, they should walk using furniture for support. So we call it furniture walking. By about 14 months, they should stand alone easily. And by 14, a little over 14 months, they should walk alone easily. Now, those are the end ranges. So you can look at the opposite. They may do that. You know, they may walk by uh, 11 and a half. My daughter walked in a nine and a half. But again, every in, like they said, there's large differences individually. As long as they're in this range, if you had a child that hadn't walked by as 18, 16, 18 months, you'd be concerned. So what we want to do as um, healthcare professionals or just, you know, in general, if you're having children or you want to know those ranges so that you can be and you want to be able to promote those activities uh, so that they're hitting these milestones. So they're making those connections so that they can progress um, appropriately in their motor skills. So that's one area. So this is a great picture to show progression of locomotion or motor skills. So you have fetal posture, so zero months, stomach, then you chin up, one month. You can see that whole progression, how they're in the chair, how they're opening the drawer, how they're walking with lead, up to walking alone at 15 months. So again, it's a, a range. So I want you to think, so this is really important. You need to know the milestones. You need to know what's important if I said, um, What's a gross motor skill they need to have by seven months? You need to know they need to sit alone at seven months. And for your discussion group, I'm going to give you some age groups. So what could you do? Some activities you can do, playful activities to get them to sit at seven months. You know, and I'm going to show you some videos that you can look and see what uh, some of the therapists and stuff are doing with them. And I want you to come up with a plan. Okay, how do I get a child to sit? Do I have, do I put toys in front of them? You know, how do I get them to roll over? Uh, I, you know, bring toys in front of like rattles and they can track with their eyes and have them grasp and, you know, roll over to their side. So I want you to think, how do we play a therapy for children? So that's where they get their environment. So how do we make productive play? So that's going to be your discussion group, but it's a great picture to know those milestones. So you're going to want to know those milestones. So now we're going to look at the dynamic systems theory. So, you know, walking isn't just using one, you know, using your legs. It incorporates many skills. So what that means is dynamic system learning theory means that you have to incorporate a lot of stuff to produce an activity. So learning to walk involves distinct skills that are organized and reorganized over time to meet goals. So if I'm walking, I have to shift my weight. I have to move my pelvis, my trunk muscles, my stomach muscles have to pull in. My leg has to activate to move forward. I have to keep balance. I can't fall over. Um, so I have all these balance skills, motor skills, you know, perceptual skills of my environment. I'm not going to trip, you know, and then I pull that all. The brain organizes it all and I produce walking. So that's the dynamic systems theory. Uh, posture is maintained by leg muscles, visual cues. Like I told you that sensory, you know, if I'm on a heel, if I'm on a hard surface, a soft surface. So I don't fall over. Um, and the inner ear. So the inner ear is a lot of balance. So making sure you know you know what's up and down so you don't fall over. Infants are just learning this. They must shift their balance. So then they take a, a take on a new posture. So that's 
not just getting one skill, they're getting a system of skill to produce a movement. So movement isn't just one activity, it produces all those movements and the brain has to organize it to um, make sense of the sensation, the motor, the balance, and then produce one outcome, a movement. So the stepping motion appears early, six or seven months old, and then walking begins. So that's why some of those reflexes are important. Some of those skills are important so that the baby start can incorporate all the skills together to produce a movement. Because remember, it's not just one thing. You're not just moving your legs. You're incorporating a whole system. So uh, balance must be learned for each movement, mobility, crawling, sitting, and it's a different type of balance. Um, our center of gravity for posture is distributed differently for each movement. So they can't just learn it for sitting and then be expected to walk. It doesn't carry over. You have to learn the individual distinct skill that's involved for each movement and different muscle groups and sequence is used to achieve each mobility. So that's basic you know, what we learn in therapy is why we treat. So we, when I'm treating a patient and I'm producing, you know, learning, sitting, teaching them how to sit or even a child in sitting, it doesn't mean that they're going to be hold their weight up, have that same effect in standing. It's a whole different muscle group and learning skill. So it doesn't carry over between skills. And you have to recalibrate your balance response, right? Walking, the ground gives you a response. You may hear a visual cue, you turn your head. So you're always recalibrating. So when you think of this dynamic system theory, it's a group of skills that's always recalibrating and think of balance as a huge part of it. And you must be able to have a sequence, right? You can't walk before you stand. So you must be able to stand in balance before you can walk. You must be able to sit up in balance before you can kind of stand. Even though that um, they don't translate, you're building on that strength and that memory learning to sequence to the next step. Because the brain and the body has learned how to hold itself up in sitting, it's become stronger and it understands that so that when it starts to transition, it's going to understand and be able to pull in those muscle groups. They won't do it a right away, but you have to be able to put those building blocks. Because I always think of posture or trunk as building blocks. So you're putting one block on top of each other. So, you know, sitting is you have one block. Now standing, I have two. I need to get that third one to be able to move now. So just think of each little step as a building block and your trunk and your balance is, is building them up till you have a strong, solid building block to do the most highest functional, which would be walking and then running. Um, so remember, infants use the environment for cues for when to walk. Just like when uh, I'm teaching my patients, we start on a sturdy surface, it's easier. It's, it's um, over a wobbly one. If I want to increase their challenges, I'll bring a wobbly one. But when we're first learning, steady, so, a solid surface because they want to learn and then they can challenge. So learn and then challenge. So you're differentiating between a mastery of component skills. you got to learn the basic skills and then you can challenge and become masters of it. So that's why you start with a sturdy um, surface. Um, skills must be mastered alone and then combined with others. So you have differentiation and integration. Differentiation is mastery of component skills and integration is combining motions and proper sequence to form a coherent working whole. So you're, when you're mastering your skills, I'm mastering you know, my, my trunk balance and I'm mastering my leg strength. But when I integrate them like to walk, I'm combining them. So I'm able to pull my trunk in and balance while I move my legs. So I'm making them work together as a whole. But when I'm differentiating, I may just be working on the trunk, doing stuff to work the trunk, or I just might be working on working the legs to get those strong so that when they come together and they integrate, we can produce that mo movement of walking. So for walking, a component skill is not usually mastered until 12 to 15 because there's a lot they have to ma master. And just remember, new walkers walk about 1,500 steps per hour. That's a fifth of a mile and they fall more than 30 times and they gain feedback. So it's that learning, we learn from our failures. So each time they fail, their body gains feedback and it takes about two months to master the skill. So with that feedback, the body, their brain is making that connection. It's, it's, it's um, fine tuning all those little axons and saying, okay, when I move an eighth of an inch this way, I'm gonna fall over. So it kind of fine tunes it. 
It makes it very efficient. So about two months of 12 to 15 months, they're walking independently. And they've got such a fine tuned motor um, response because that brain has integrated um, the learning pattern. So if you're not exposed to that, so you can imagine why you have late walkers or if you're not stimulated in that. You refine even more with practice. So practice helps refinement because again, you're giving the stimuli to make the axons and the neurons make the change. You'll, you'll show increased stride, improved arm swing, you progress to running. So most two-year-olds have a hurried walk instead of running. The legs move stiffly because they can't single leg balance. They can't hold their whole weight on one leg. But by five to six, they tend to run easily with change of speed and direction. So all that takes time, integration, and the more practice, the better they are at it. So we talked about gross motor, which is walking, crawling. Um, let's talk about fine motor skills. So grasping involves coordinating the movement. So it's just grasping using the hands, mostly fine motors. So grasping involves co coordinating the movement of individual fingers. Children can generally dress and undress themselves by the age of five. So think about that child, put that picture to it. Babies typically develop handedness by the age of one. So that's if they're gonna be left or right handed. And uh, handedness is generally a result of genes and the environment. So of course you have you know, a left handed and a right handed gene, but if your parent you know, makes you do everything left handed, then you may become left handed because the, the, um, the environment, the stimuli made you use your left hand. Um, industrialized society favors right-handed people, right? So what could you think of some examples of that? So any lefties in the class? So our scissors, how about scissors, right? All the things that you use in your hands, aren't they mostly made for right-handed? Was it difficult for you to learn those skills when you were young and even now? So let's think about some milestones with uh, fine motors. So infants lack it, one year olds become very talented. So in that first year, they're gonna gain a lot of skills in their fine motors. So by four months, infants can successfully reach for objects. It's clumsy, but again, remember that refinement of movement, the more they practice, it gets better with time and practice. Grasping is more difficult, coordinating individual fingers to manipulate an object. And if you remember that grasping palmar reflex starts to go away at four months. So that's why they need that to go away so they can begin that active movement. So by four months, they can just, they use just their fingers to hold the objects and they're holding it very tightly. By seven to eight months, they use their thumbs. So that's very important to have those, the thumb pull in and makes a much stronger grip. And not until their first baby birthday do babies make multiple adjustments for reaching for objects. So they may reach for it, change their hand position, we, you know, get a better grip. So not till about their first baby birthday are they have that refinement skill where they can integrate the multiple uh, components to have a full um, integrated grip, grasp and change of uh, multiple adjustments. So as they develop then coordination of two hands, so two hands becomes greater. So at four months, each hand has a mind of its own. So if the right hand's doing something, the left hand has no idea. They're not learning together, that's four months. By five to six months, they use both hands to reach for a common goal. So they realize, oh, I have a left, I have a right. They can work together. So that's five to six months. The brain makes that con connection. Preschool children tend to feed and dress themselves with increased precision of hands and fingers. So that progression is two to three years old. They put on simple clothes and zippers. Three to four year olds can fasten buttons and take clothes off. And five year olds can dress themselves except for tying shoes, which is usually by six years old. And actually my daughter in first grade, that was one of the requirements is to be able to tie their shoe. So most, um, so just remember, you know, most children right-handed by first year and uh, left most equipment, scissors, school desks, can openers are made for right-handed people. So think about that when you're thinking, um, picture that child with these milestones. And remember these milestones, they're very important. And think about how you would get a child, because that's one of the things you have to do a fine motor, how are you going to get them to interact and play? So if you have a five to six month, how are you going to use two hands? What, can, what kind of play can you do to use two hands. So some of those videos I'm gonna show is gonna show you in them interacting with this. So you're gonna make up your own plan to uh, show how to play with that, but you need to know these milestones. So this is just a, a picture of those milestones we talked about. So the first one, the newborn is pre-reaching. So they just have no control. They just kind of have that hand, it looks very flat. So at three to four months, that's the ulnar grasp. So that's your pinky finger grasp. So they're using a lot of that just gross hand, right? 
at four to five months, they, we use, remember we said that's when they um, can start transferring the object from hand to hand. So you can see they're using both. They realize they have both a right and a left hand. And by nine months, it's called a pincer grasp. So that's the, the thumb to the finger. And that's when they begin to pick up stuff, right? So it's very important, right? Cheerios, food, they begin to able to start feeding themselves. So that's a very important thing. So occupational therapists would be working with children on fine motor skills if they are not meeting those milestone um, timeframes. So we're just going to skip over this slide and we'll go over it in the next um, part two of the lecture. So this is a great picture. Look at this to study from and when you're thinking about um, what your play you're going to um, write up for the discussion group. And it's your child's early development is a journey. And so it tells you uh, kind of all the things they go through the little, um, not the yellow book road, but the multicolored road, you know, road here and gives you some great, just basic, you know, not just um, motor milestones, but um, language and cognitive milestones as well. So these video, all these milestone videos will be underneath this lecture video and you're going to want to watch all of them so that you can see how the, those milestones are attained. And you're going to want to see how the uh, therapists and the assessors interact with the children because you're going to want to, you're going to be watching and be assigned an age group. And you're going to be assigned how uh, to develop a play program for a family to uh, stimulate these children um, in the home environment to reach these milestones. So that's the end of this part. I know it was kind of long, but it's a lot to cover. The other part will be shorter. And I will see you on part two of this week. Thank you.